All right. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to our last brown bag lecture of the semester, if you can believe it. My name is Kara Larson, and I'm a PhD student here at UMA and a member of the Brown Bag Committee. It is my pleasure to introduce today's speaker, Jordan Galzinski. Jordan is a PhD candidate in Near Eastern Languages and Cultures at UCLA. Her dissertation research is titled Weaving Identity, a study of identity construction through the depictions of dress in New Kingdom elite tombs. She is also a professional fellow with the Getty Research Institute and has years of field experience working in Egypt, Ethiopia, and Israel. Today, she will be presenting a talk entitled Masculine Ideals and Dress in New Kingdom Elite Tombs. Please join me in welcoming Jordan. Thank you all. Uh, thank you, Kara, for inviting me to speak with you all today. Um, let me share my screen. Does everything look good? Okay. Um, so thank you all for having me. This is really exciting. Um, I hope you like Egypt and uh, tomb paintings because we're going to be looking at a lot of them today. Um, so this work, as Kara mentioned, is tangentially related to my dissertation. Um, and as I was working through, you know, gathering data for my dissertation, which looks specifically at, you know, New Kingdom elite tomb scenes, I noticed that dress can actually be really useful in uh, looking at masculinity and the display of masculinity in these tombs. And upon further inspection, I found that there actually wasn't a lot of work done on masculinity in uh, ancient Egypt in general. Um, so I wanted to explore this further. And so I initially presented part of this um, at the, uh, for the, the most recent ASOR. Um, but of course, that's limited by time and 20 minutes. So there was a lot of things I wanted to talk about and look into further. And um, so this is me going deeper into things and developing some more thoughts I had upon completion of that. So I'm really interested to see and um, hear your thoughts um, on this work. And if you have any questions throughout, you know, feel free to throw them in the, in the Q&A and I will address them at the end. Okay, so as I mentioned, and as others have uh, already mentioned, two in particular, Wilfong and Parkinson, that there's kind of an overall lack of study on masculinity and Egyptology. Um, this is really strange to me because in, you know, in my studies on dress, men are the ones who can show themselves in different ways through their dress. Um, women tend to have a much more static, um, conservative uh, dress, right? Men can show themselves in a variety of different ways and display this masculinity differently than women. Um, and so, and we all know that gender is a very popular topic within ancient studies. Um, but, you know, in most cases, when people speak of gender, they're often talking about um, women, right? And this in no way tries to undermine the study of women. Um, masculinity studies in, in actuality is usually a subset of feminist theory and can really contribute to our understanding of women's experience in the past. Um, but, you know, we also should look at uh, the construction of masculine and masculine ideals as well. So first, I'm gonna go through some theory. So hang with me a bit about um, you know, the Egyptian construction of gender norms and gender roles. We'll look at how dress can be used to investigate identity, um, things like this. And then we'll go into um, establishing these masculine ideals from uh, an Egyptian emic perspective using some literature. And then we'll do a little case study looking at one tomb in particular from the, uh, the nobles tombs on the West Bank of Thebes, the, the tomb of Nacht. Um, with some comparison to some other individuals as well. Um, and overall, my argument is that we can't speak of masculinity as this kind of monolithic given that, you know, looking at the dress, we see masculinities, plural, right? That there's multiple overlapping masculinity, masculinities present it, via the tomb. Um, and that there's this intersectionality going on that we have to be um, aware of. Okay, 
So first, of course, we have to start with definitions. Um, so when I speak of gender, I'm speaking about the sum of constantly changing associations, attitudes, and practices prescribed by human social groups for their members, usually according to a sex body. And in ancient Egypt, we'll talk about it in a second, it's, off, it's connected to a sex body. And I wanna emphasize here um, the intersectionality of ident identities, right? It's not something that's static, it's constantly changing. It depends on, it depends on other components of their identity, be it their sexual orientation, uh, status, rank, ethnicity, occupation, a variety of other factors, right? Another caveat is that I'm only speaking about the New Kingdom elite male. Um, so what might be a marker of masculinity in the 18th dynasty, as we're going to look at, you know, might not apply to the 19th dynasty or might not apply earlier in time. Though we do see a lot of consistency, um, we shouldn't assume, right, that these things are, um, you know, across the board and across time unless proven true. So just an example to kind of illustrate this point of how dress can be used to understand these things. Um, so for the king here, we have Djoser on the left from the Set Pyramid, one of the panels in, um, under, in his catacombs underneath the pyramid, um, running the headset, a coronation ritual for kingship. And here we have him in almost nude, only with a penis tie. And so here nudity is linked to a, a gain in power, right? The king takes off his clothes, um, to in his coronation ritual to gain power to be re, you know, rejuvenated in a way. But if you compare this to the other scene on the right from the Mastaba of T, we have nudity here showing a lower status individual, right? These men fishing and um, hunting, croc uh, hippopotami here, clothing here, nudity here is to show that they're lower status than the tomb owner who is off to the side with more clothing on. Um, so here you see, as we just kind of said, that the clothing and the context, right, all this is key. The other aspects of the identity of the individual are key when looking at these things. So we're going to um, be really picking apart the, the context and the associations with these images. So turning to the Egyptian concept of gender. So how did they conceive of gender? Um, and Mescal, who's a, who's a um, very popular and famous theorist on Egyptian um, identity, right? She points out that there is no distinction between sex and gender in the Egyptian mind, right? They didn't separate it like we do today. They were one and the same. Um, the language was gendered, right? We have a feminine T added to words to denote ma masculine or feminine words. Um, as a side note, there has been some study looking at evidence for you know, third genders or non-binary individuals or things like this within, within um, Egyptian evidence. There are some words that maybe point to this. They're difficult to translate. They're usually hapaxes or things like this. Um, so I think overall, the, it's still inconclusive, but there are people working on this. Maybe not as much as we would like, but um, people are looking to this, so it would be um, so stay tuned, I guess, to see if anything further comes out. But overall, it's a very binary um, male-female world. And I think as many of you know and can see here that the art is very gendered, right? So based off skin color, a lighter tone for women, a more reddish tone for men, body posture and pose, women are much more static. Um, uh, static in movement, men have more active, always shown with the more open legs stance. Um, proportions, men are just proportionally bigger than women. Um, relative size too, this is not just all, not just gendered, but also depending on whoever's the most important person in the scene will be the biggest. As you can see here, the attendants behind Mena and his wife are smaller and on a separate register um, because they're not as important as Mena and his wife. And as uh, important for this uh, talk is the you know, hair, the dress, and the accessories that are also highly gendered as well. So what were the masculine ideals for an Egyptian man? I think it's important first to kind of 
to establish these um, before we look at the art because I'm assuming a knowledge of um, some of the literature when I'm looking at the art. So I wanted to do a slight dive into this stuff um, to establish what a man should be um, in the Egyptian mind. So the first one that comes to mind um, is useful, muscular, procreative man. Um, and I should note that these obviously all apply to an elite male. I'm pulling all these from texture, textual and literary sources. Um, and so we're kind of looking at a very unique specific category of Egyptian uh, society, but presumably these might have crossed, um, you know, status and rank boundaries as well. So looking first at this one ideal of being useful, muscular, procreative, we have a couple, I pulled just a couple uh, sources here to establish this, right? We have Sinawe before he runs off to Syria, Palestine, and is adopted by the people he encounters. Um, the leader of those people placed him at the head of his children, having seen the strength of his arms. So having been wowed by his his vigor and the strength, um, he gets put at the forefront of his children. And this strong arm, this ah 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 um, terminology is very common. It's often associated with the king having a strong arm, you know, in, in subduing enemies and things like this. So you see this popping up as a lot. In a later tale, the tale of the two brothers, um, we have a scene where the female character desires her husband's brother. Um, and she says to him, you know, she can see how strong he is, she can see his vigor, and she sexually desires to know him. So we know then, okay, this is something that was desirable um, within Egyptian culture, is to be strong, to be vigorous, uh, muscular, things like this. And in some instruction literature, we also have references to, you know, equating happiness with having a lot of children. So, you know, the one whose people are many, who has a lot of kids, he is saluted on account of his progeny, he is happy. So this is what one of the aspects or one of the criteria for what a man should do, right? He should be strong, muscular, useful, procreative. Another one kind of on the flip side is the more bureaucratic, administrative, wise man often shown, right, we've seen these seated scribal statues with belly rolls, and I feel like this is all of us in grad school working at our desks. Um, so we have this contrast between, you know, super youthful, vigor, muscular male with this more wise, older, established scribal male in a way. And we have this in so many texts, I guess, picked a few here, but you know, the satire of the trades, the whole text, the satire of the trades text is about why all the other jobs are bad and why being a scribe is good. Um, so there's nothing better than books, right? There's no profession without a boss, except for the scribe, he is his own boss. Um, another text in the tomb of Rechmere, so he was a vizier, so the next office below the king talks about the vizier's office and how it's the pillar of the whole land. Um, so being in this high administrative role is, you know, the pinnacle um, of achievement for a non-royal elite. And a later text, Papyrus Lansing talks about, you know, loving writing, becoming a worthy official, wise in planning, skilled in speech, and being a magistrate, sitting, you know, and watching and overseeing in your house. So establishing the other kind of ideal masculine it's to be you know involved in the administration involved in the bureaucracy writing seated um, so you have these juxtaposed against each other and lastly we also have pops up a lot of times is the kind of pious respectful dutiful man um, and we see this in pretty much all the instruction literature has these do not do this, do not do that, related to related to you know being in the temple, observe your God, don't raise your voice, don't be unclean, um, don't cheat, lie or steal, things like this. About you know they're all very moralizing. So of how you should act, and with the connotation that if you do something bad or lie or cheat, then the gods will. Um, you know, 
you'll be punished by the gods. And so you can see the instructions of Ani here, the instructions of Amenope, right? About building your tomb, sharing in the offering of your gods, so doing things right, you know, having a tomb, being revered, and being safe from the wrath of the gods. So if you act in these, you know, ways and you get a tomb, everything will be okay. The gods won't be, won't be vengeful. So all these together, we have already, you know, a very varying forms of kind of masculine ideals showing up, right? Through, through literature, we have a more vigorous man, a more muscular, youthful one, one maybe involved in the administration of the bureaucracy, and then this also pious, more respectful one. And these aren't separate. I separated them into kind of into categories here, but these, as we will see, coexist and overlap and um, are enveloped within each other as well. So keep this in mind as we're going through the artistic evidence, because I'll be referencing these um, specific ideals later on. And quickly, so just to get into a little bit more theory um, before we get to the case study. So first I wanted just to define how I'm, I use the word dress a lot. Um, and when I say dress, I don't mean just clothing. I mean all worn elements of the body, clothing, hair, jewelry, body modifications, tattooing, anything that's worn on the body. Um, and so this is important to keep in mind. I'm not just talking about textiles or clothing. My dissertation and this research uh, here employs an approach developed by uh, Synot and others uh, have adapted it more recently where it argues that the the body social, right? The body and visual representations of the body um, can be read or understood by the viewer since the social, cultural, and physical environment are embedded within that, that representation um, and worn in a way, if you want to relate it back to dress, right? And Synat calls this the bodily hexis, which is kind of a, it's a maybe a confusing term, but essentially that all this stuff is wrapped up into the visual representation of the body and that a viewer can read and interpret and that can be communicated in all the social, cultural, physical um, milieu around that production of that image can be received by the viewer. Um, so essentially dress and clothing um, is one of the manifestations of this hexus. Um, it can be, it is an embodied, marker of the identity of the wearer because all the social, cultural, um, physical environment that went into choosing what dress to put on that visual representation is embedded in that and the viewer can receive it. And so dress then um, has the ability to communicate a lot of things. And I think this is fairly obvious. We, when you look at someone on the street that you don't know, you can interpret a lot of things about their identity, whether correct or incorrectly. So obviously that, you know, takes a play, comes into play, um, but you can establish, you know, individual and group identities, uh, social status and rank, gender, ethnicity, things like this from dress. And in the ancient world, I think even more so because, especially in ancient Egypt, because what was allowed to be depicted um, was highly structured and systemized. It wasn't the individual agency, though there um, was a lot less present than today, right? Where you get up and you choose what you want to wear. Um, that was obviously happening for them in lived experience, but what is allowed to be depicted on in a tomb scene, on a tomb, um, is more structured. And we'll talk about that in a second. And I think another thing to think about is the that the materiality of dress also influences how one can express this identity as well. And so this will come up a little later um, with how they choose to represent, visually depict dress to emphasize certain aspects um, of Nacht, our tomb owner, we're gonna look at his masculine identity. So as I mentioned a little bit, um, for those not familiar with Egyptian art, I wanted to do a little dive into it. So there's 
a debate about, you know, the degree of reality and accuracy of everything in the tomb, um, but especially of dress, right? We see Sinedrim here and his wife cutting grain in their really nice clothing. Probably did not happen. This is not accurate. Sinedrim was not cutting grain in his really nice fine linen with his wife. Um, so then, you know, what's going on? Why is this seen in the tomb? Why is it being depicted like this? And Baines and others have argued essentially that Egyptian art was never art for art's sake, right? There was always a, another level, um, another function, in most cases, ideological connected to this, to this art, how we see it, it, it as art. Um, so in this scene for Sinejim here, for example, the scene wasn't included to be a memory of something that happened in his life or something like that, but it's to ensure that they have grain and all these goods in the afterlife. So it's it's not to say, oh, this is actually what happened, but it's supposed to say you will always have, you know, nice fresh grain um, in the afterlife. And this often the dress gets pulled into this debate as well because it's obviously very highly idealized um, and it's very ideologically charged. So we see, you know, the finest, nicest dress in these in tombs. Um, it's often turned their Sunday best, right? So it's like their church clothes, they're shown in all their really nice, their um, ideologically proper uh, clothes because it's a tomb. And so, and this gets wrapped up in the supposed Egyptian distaste for wool, where you see everyone saying, oh, the Egyptians didn't wear wool, the Egyptians don't like wool. And to me, it's that, we have a very specific, we only have evidence for textiles in most cases from tombs and temples, right? So you're seeing very ideologi ideologically charged spaces where linen was the appropriate dress and in tombs where also linen was the appropriate grave good. At, you know, um, at cities, excavations of cities like Amarna, for example, they do find some wool, they found wool at Lahoon as well. So I don't think it's, you know, fair to say that the Egyptians didn't wear any wool that, and those were never, you know, included in their everyday dress. I think it's just that we're seeing a very, like a snippet um, of what could have been uh, their whole wardrobe um, in these tomb scenes. And so the reality of this dress we see in the tombs does not, however, detract from us using it to investigate identity because it's still being used in a specific way in these specific systems um, to communicate to the viewer. Um, so we just obviously have to be more aware and saying that this isn't, you know, 100% the lived reality of how people were dressing and what they looked like and things, but it was a part of it. Okay, let's get into the actual tomb now. So we're on, we're down in modern day Luxor here in Thebes. We're focusing in on the West Bank here um, in the vet tombs of the nobles um, here circled from two different perspectives. We're a little south of Hatshepsut Temple at Deir al-Bahri, if you're familiar, a little south of Valley of the Kings, a little northeast of Deir al-Medina. And so this is one of the cemeteries that was popular during the New Kingdom for elites to be um, buried. And so this is where our case study is, is located. So we're focusing in on Nacht's tomb here, the tomb of Nacht, um, dated to between the reign of Thotmosis IV and Amenhotep III, um, excavated by the Met. Um, it's very similar to tombs of other tombs of the same date. So it's, you know, it's decorative schema is pretty uh, standard. Um, and Knox, whose name means strong, perhaps an interesting show of uh, masculinity by itself. Um, he was a priest of the hours of Amun, um, a title sometimes translated as astronomer, which is pretty cool, and a scribe. And so these titles don't really aren't that impressive, um, don't really show a man of import, but obviously he was he of a very elite status, perhaps through family connections or something to have a tomb here and have such a nice tomb. 
And on that note, we have very little geneo genealogic uh, family information recorded in his tomb. We have a wife, we have kids, but we don't have his parents and their titles to kind of show what his larger family um, status was. And um, if you go to the tomb today, you can see this a reconstruction of this of the statue in the tomb, which unfortunately was lost at sea when it was being shipped back to the Met. So uh, maybe another note of not taking taking things from their tombs. This tomb, like others, was unfinished um, when when closed. Um, and you know, older Egyptologists originally interpret this to mean that these tombs were generic, that they were just kind of built wholesale, and then the king would maybe distribute them to his elites at some point. But the work of Hartwig and others, had, I think she's convincingly shown that this is not true, that the tomb owner had um, a lot of involvement in the construction of the tomb. We have graffiti, we have um, some text talking about the, the tomb owner, um, you know, choosing things in the tomb and being involved with how he represented and um, interacting with the artists commissioning the tomb. So we know it wasn't just um, these generic tombs being built, but the, the owner did have some agency, which we'll talk more about at the end. So getting into some of the um, tomb scenes, we're gonna look at three tomb scenes, um, time willing. And uh, we have one of Nox seated, one of Nox standing, and one of Nox more in motion. And I hope, as I, as I hope to show, by looking at the dress, we can um, delineate the types of masculinities we see evolving, um, revolving in this tomb. So in this first scene on the east wall south side, um, Noct here is sitting in a booth, um, looking out at his fields with laborers in front of him, winnowing and threshing grain. And these Scenes of daily life, as they're called, are really useful in understanding status, rank, identity um, of the various individuals, right? So we have Noct here dressed in a sheer wraparound garment with kilt. Um, the garment is leaving his right arm exposed, which we'll talk about later. It's actually very important. Um, his active arm is left out. Um, you see a shoulder length wig, a wetsa collar, he's holding a staff and folded cloth. We'll go into all these more in a second. So what types of masculinity can we see in this scene? I would argue that we see this, as I talked about earlier, we're seeing this more administrative, um, you know, high status managerial masculinity being shown and the dress contributes to this to this understanding, right? First, Noct is proportionally larger than everyone else in the scene. And as per canons of Egyptian art, whoever's biggest is most important. So we have this laid out very clearly. Next, Noct is also more elaborately dressed than everyone in the scene, right? And in opposition to Joser running the headset in nudity, here we have um, less clothes equals lower status, right? So Noct, again, is clearly shown here as the most important person because he is the most elaborately dressed. Um, he's shown in this layered garment, right? A conspicuous consumption in a way. Linen, maybe in opposition to how we think of clothes today was actually very expensive and a, and a luxury good, especially, you know, the finer and sheerer the linen. Um, we have some texts from Dior Medina even talking about garments costing, you know, as much as some livestock or things like this being, you know, being very high valued luxury goods. Amarna letters talk about trading textiles between the great kings, right? So don't think of it in our kind of fast fashion um, of textiles and cloth being pretty inexpensive nowadays. The pure white of Knox uh, linen also adds value, right? He is saying, you know, white equals I can either, I'm not getting dirty, right? I'm not engaging in this manual labor or I can afford a launderer who's cleaning and whitening my clothes through a variety of processes, which we can talk about if you're interested. Um, and so this layering and excessiveness in a way in opposition to the other people in the scene contributes to this 
administrative understanding because right the dress the dress's materiality constricts and so it's showing that he doesn't need to move he's he you know he's not involved in labor where you need to be moving and um engaging in in more active motions but that he the dress is constricting because he doesn't need to um, be moving around he's just watching and overseeing and managing these people talking speaking on the wig um robbins has a very it's a great article about how wigs can be used to denote social status and class and she argues that a the longer shoulder length wig like we see here um, means someone of a senior status while you know smaller cropped shorter wigs equals lower status so obviously here we have again someone who's advanced in their career a senior status elite individual last looking at the staff and cloth um, we can see these two objects are epitomized by one of one of the hieroglyphs, um, it's the Sarah hieroglyph, meaning official. Um, it's a man holding a holding a staff, and they're also associated with other scepter type um, objects that are used to write words like authority, sechem, or to control harap. Right. So these objects themselves, these icons, denote you know these uh, words within the Egyptian mind. And going back to the active arm, we see open. So, so the, the way the dress is wrapped and depicted here emphasizes this right arm, which is the active arm in the Egyptian mind. He's holding the staff. This is his active doing arm. Um, so you see this emphasized here. Um, Robin's also on her work looking at body proportions and how they change over time argues that in the New Kingdom, we see a more feminized uh, male body. And this is to perhaps show, you know, he's not, he's not as muscular. He's not, um, as we'll see later on here, because he's not engaged in manual labor, perhaps. So they're, they're emphasizing this, um, his more managerial position. And so the strength and control denoted here maybe isn't physical, but is you know in the described status because of his position. So he's in control of everything that's going on in front of him, and you can see this displayed through um, the dress and the other dress elements involved. And so we can see this specific type of masculinity in this scene, right? We have one where the man should be managerial, administrative and this is all reaffirmed through the dress um, and the other objects that uh, Nacht is wearing. And you see in other contemporaneous tombs, um, sometimes even the individual in this scene has more corpulent body, so is even kind of more like that scribal statue we saw earlier where there's like fat rolls and stuff, even further emphasizing the lack of movement um, and manual labor that the individual is engaging in. Moving to our next scene, uh, east wall and north side of the tomb, we have Nacht and his wife Tawi here um, making an offering, pouring a libation before a series of offerings to the god Amun. Um, this is all indicated in the text above them. And here we have Nacht a little differently dressed, right? A little bit more um, conservatively, I think we could say. He has a knee length kilt on, a sheer wrap around, the shoulder length wig again, some more jewelry, and even a short little beard. Um, and so here, the type of masculinity we're seeing um, is this more pious, right? The more dutiful, conservative male um, we talked about earlier. And this is especially denoted in his juxtaposition to his wife, who we have in the scene now, and to the other attendants behind him. And um, so first we have Nacht standing, which is in a different uh, pose than in our last scene. And this is to show he's subscribing, um, subscribing to social rules, right? If you are, we have instruction literature that talks about if you're, um, you're not to seat, sit when someone who is of a higher status is in front of you. Um, so obviously he's offering to Amun, so he needs to be standing up and making offerings to the perceived God that's um, 
that's there. And in this scene type where you have the tomb owner making an offering to a god or in this more religiously charged scene, um, the tomb owner, not here in this case, are never depicted in the elaborate garments like you see in the first scene of them sitting wrapped, enveloped in all these layers. You don't see that ever in these scene types. Um, you always see a more conservative dress, uh, just you know, very basic. This changes later on the 19th and 20th dynasties for a variety of reasons, which my dissertation is looking at, but in 18 dynasty tombs, you only see this more kind of basic conservative style in the specific tomb scenes. And again, not being the most important character in this scene, um, indicated not by just his size, but also his dress, right? He's wearing more than everyone else. Everyone else just has, you know, a kilt on, but he has the kilt and the sheer wraparound to show, you know, one added layer of, of, of status. And I think it's also important to contrast Noct with his wife here. Um, again, mentioning just, you know, gender norms and art. He has his, you know, legs outstretched in a more active movement where uh, Tawi, the wife here, um, she's much more constricted by her dress, clothes, legs, uh, more static movement. Um, and again, we still have the more feminized body that Robbins talks about, um, but Tawi's body is even more feminized in contrast to keep this uh, gendered contrast. And so this masculinity you see here is subtly different than the first, right? We still have this um, established higher status and rank through the dress, but it's, it's more bounded by decorum, um, if you want to use Baines's uh, word, to um, in a more, you know, he's bounded because of this more ideologically charged scene. He has to be more conservative um, since he's, you know, in doing things with the gods. And our last scene that we'll be looking at is knocked in motion. Um, and I think this is the most interesting scene because we have two knocks down here. Um, and here we have the more, you know, muscular, virile, procreative uh, masculinity being shown. Um, we have two knocks being shown here. Um, we have the knock on the left with the shorter uh, cropped wig, a young knock perhaps um, with a throw stick. And on the other knock on the other side has the longer shoulder length wig with a harpoon that is no longer um, visible, surrounded by their children, or his children, I guess, if this is the same, same knocked, right? Um, wearing a kilt with an internal apron, which is the thing that's hanging down between, between his legs, and then a sheer wraparound as well. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, right, the one of the main ways to portray gender is through body posture. And so here we see a very active motion, which is only men are ever shown in this um, position of the outstretched legs, active in the smiting, almost smiting motif, which is you know only seen with kings. Side note: the only time you see a woman in this position is Nefertiti um, when she arguably ruled as king. So, but otherwise, it's only men. So that's um, you know interesting within itself, and it harkens or it mimics this kingly smiting motif we see. So what does this dress tell us, um, right? So in comparison to the scene where Noct is seated, right, we see here less clothes being used to emphasize the type of masculinity, emphasizing the, um, the physique here. Um, the triangular physique, which Mescal argues the Egyptians invented, which I think is pretty interesting and, and, and funny in a way. And again, the kilt being linked to movement, um, being the stereotypical masculine garment where it allows for more movement, uh, it does not constrict. Um, and in earlier versions of this scene, there's even less dress uh, shown, right? It's usually just a short kilt, no wrap around. It's as you get into the 18th and later dynasties, they're adding more linen. Um, perhaps to show you know, more conspicuous consumption, to show your wealth and status, or just adhering to fashions of the time it was no longer, you know, that was no longer in vogue. Um, so I think that's important. Next, the wigs. Again, the wigs keep coming back as very key uh, icons here. 
we have the wig on the right, the familiar shoulder length one, establishing a man of more advanced age, advanced in his career, established, that's great. The wig on the left, however, is the shorter, more cropped wig, which as I talked about earlier, Robin says means they're young and useful. So do we have knocked at two different life stages, right? A younger knock versus an older knocked being shown here in this scene and that we're supposed to kind of uh, think of it as an knock throughout his life, or is this a show of two different versions of masculinity being embodied at the same time, right? We're supposed to think of Nox being useful and procreative, but also think of Nox being established and advancing his career um, and of a high status. I would argue the second. Um, and I think it connects to how these scenes have been interpreted and how these things function. And in most cases, these scenes have been interpreted to be connected to rebirth and fertility Right, you see all the children around him. I think it's pretty obvious. Um, and having, you know, a more young, useful knock depicted here, you know, it's connected to this. And so this last masculinity we'll talk about is the more active, useful, masculine, muscular uh, masculinity we see. And you know, and this is in contrast to the other two knocks where the more feminized body is shown. Here we have a lot. Uh, more muscles, he's a little thicker um, being shown. And obviously it's connected to the, the purpose of the scene being connected to fertility and procreation. Um, Robbins has even argued that the ties in the front, um, the protrusions in the front of his garment and even the apron hanging down between the legs is to be read as um, a allusion to the phallus and that you never see elites depicted with their phallus, so they have to allude to them in other ways. And Robbins argues they do it through the dress and it would work in this scene if we're talking about fertility and procreation, that you'd want that illusion to be made. Um, so that might be why you're seeing a specific type of dress being used in this instance. And as I mentioned, right, we see in the instruction literature that happy is the man who has a lot of progeny. You see all the progeny around knocked here. So I think it's pretty clear what the purpose and function of the scene is and the type of masculinity they're trying to, to show. And so just some conclusions, um, I wanted to point out a few things, right? I think it's pretty clear that the, there's a relationship between the activity of the scene, the function of the scene, the amount and type of dress being worn, and then the masculinity and other aspects of identity that are being emphasized here. And the dress other, other dress elements, right, are also really important to reading and understanding the scene. In a lot of cases, the wigs were super important, right? So is, this adds further credence to not just studying textiles or dress by themselves, but you have to take these, someone's um, whole look uh, holistically when trying to look at identity of the wearer. Um, and lastly, I would just like to, I think, again, it's pretty clear, but that there's no monolithic um, masculinity at play here. We see a bunch of different types of man and a bunch of different types of knocked at play. And it's not to say that these are all um, separate entities, but that they're, you know, intersectional with the type of, with the, not only the context of the scene, but often, you know, the status of the wearer, the activity, gender, I didn't get into the women at all, but you could definitely bring that in as well to understand these scenes better. And so thinking about um, the intersectionality of the various aspects of identity when looking at masculinity and seeing that, you know, it's not just that Noct is supposed to be a useful, vigorous, virile male, but he's also supposed to be administrative and um, and pious and that they, all these are happening concurrently and there's not, they're not mutually exclusive of each other. It's what I'm trying to say. And lastly, I just wanna conclude with thinking about some of Knox's contemporaries and how they compare. Um, is there any evidence for, you know, individual agency within these tombs? How much did the tomb owner get to decide of how he was shown? And what can we see going on in other contemporary tombs? I here just 
post um, the tomb of Mena here from his fishing in Fallon scene. And I think pretty quickly you can see he's dressed rather differently um, than Noct is. Similar, a lot of similar elements, but with other additions. He has a little tiny fat rolls on his belly. And so what is trying to be said, what is Mena trying to say versus Noct? And why are there these differences? Robbins has argued that the sameness we see across these tombs reinforces group identity, group decorum, and things like this. But then how are we to understand these differences we do see as well? Um, was this Mena's choice? What's going on here? And is it, for example, Mena was a much higher status um, individual than Noct, and so may, is that why there's these slight differences? Mena can afford a lot nicer garments, so he's trying to show his wealth through the depiction of them, perhaps. Um, and so these questions about individual versus group identity, um, artistic preference, like what's going on here? These are questions I'm left with. I still haven't come up with good answers for them. Um, and I hope to explore most of these further in my dissertation, but I would also love to hear your thoughts on them. Um, if you have any comparable situations going on in other cultures that you guys are studying, I would like, I would love to hear what you think. And so thank you so much for inviting me and it was really great um, speaking with you all today. And here's my contact information if you have any comments or questions um, beyond what you can ask here. Awesome, thank you, Jordan. That was wonderful. Yeah. Um, I direct people if they have questions, we do have time for questions. Um, to go ahead and pop them in the Q&A chat, um, and then we'll work through them. Um, I will say, uh, first, I feel very seen in talking about uh, belly rolls, <laughs> but I want <laughs> to, right? Um, but after COVID, I mean. <laughs> right, after COVID. So I, you touched on, um, actually, one of the questions I had jotted down um, in talking about agency, and I was thinking, you know, because art, I feel it's, it's especially important within anthropological archaeology approaches to um, the past. And just thinking through um, signaling theory and kind of mm -hmm. what, you know, we're talking about agency and what uh, these elite individuals are trying to say um, about themselves, if they have a say in that, um, and also what that's trying to signal to others. Um, I'm wondering mm -hmm. if you've engaged in any of that um, literature or you know maybe thought about it in that perspective I actually haven't looked at that theory I just jotted it down to have a look I think uh, just based off what you just said right now it seems like it would actually work really well um, the evidence is hard because it's like we're looking at these tomb themes so it's like this very specific funerary sphere right so we're not saying this is how their identity was in life. This is what dress was in life. It's, you know, why are they being shown in this way in this specific instance in the tomb and what that says. This also brings up, you know, who is seeing these tomb scenes? Um, do, how much access do people have to these tombs? It's still very debatable. Um, and so who's seeing these things? Um, how many people are seeing them in life while the tomb is being constructed? And then obviously once the tomb owner dies and is placed in the tomb, how accessible these spaces are and how people are seeing them and interacting with them is a huge question that plays a big role in my dissertation. Um, but I think the signaling theory sounds very interesting to think about, yeah, the, the um, you know, the, um, what's the word? cross interaction between the viewer and the, the object being viewed and how it's referencing. We do have a really interesting case, TT45. It was originally an 18th dynasty tomb um, and it was reused in the 19th dynasty by someone who had the same title. So obviously has a, some type of connection, not familial though. And he, you know, covered everything up on the walls and you know, put his own tomb scenes there, except for one scene, he left the original. So this kind of interaction with the past and what, you know, is being choose, 
how he chose to leave one scene of his previous um, job holder in the tomb and why he did that and all these things. And they were both um, overseers of these weaving installations. That's why I was interested in them. And so he chose to leave the older um, clothing and dress of one seat up. And we do see also like in certain tombs where parents or older individuals are depicted, they purposely put them in antiquated dress to show that they're older, like, oh, you're in the 18th dynasty style while I'm in like the newer fashion of the time. Um, so there's obviously a really interesting dialectic going on between these things. And it's just, yeah, it's so hard because in Egypt, it's, we have just so much evidence, but a very weird, you know, a lot of funerary evidence and then a lot of temple evidence, but not a lot of city. <laughs> um, right. Yeah, it, it, it does become very biased in that perspective. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm wondering too, you talk about the reusing of the tombs and I know we have, um, comparative case studies and, you know, completely other regions of the world and different time periods of kind of removing the past um, to kind of signal that erasure um, mm -hmm. and reestablishment of, you know, that current leader's authority. Um, yeah. So it's interesting that they, they left certain portions of mm -hmm. the original um, artworks, which is fascinating. Yeah, and you have we're actually doing a reuse seminar next quarter, the grad students. So we've been looking at some of the literature and you have some instances in instructional text talking about like not using things of the past, like it's taboo, like don't destroy someone else's stuff and use it to make something new. And so it's interesting that you do see then a lot of tomb reuse and that he wasn't trying to hide the fact that he was reusing a tomb. So then is it saying, did he get permission? Is it not? Is it condoned? Um, how these things are working out are very interesting. Yeah, absolutely. For sure. Um, if nobody else has another question, I just have one more question. Uh, you mentioned it's a yes. little bit of a tidbit, um, and this is just my own personal fascination. Um, you mentioned Nefertiti's depiction mm -hmm. as mm -hmm. a male figure, and I'm recalling on my limited knowledge, but Mm -hmm. um, well, she she was depicted relatively masculine, and other like I think I remember someone reading that she was depicted with like a beard. Often is that true, or am I just hallucinating? <laughs> well, so like when she's as queen with Akhenaten, Akhenaten gets kind of more feminized, and she gets a little bit more masculinized. And typically, it's understood to be like it's this androgyny that's going on because they're meant to be, you know superhuman meta meta people um but then we have a couple scenes where i mean i think it's pretty well established that after akhenaten died that Nefer nefertiti ruled solely and there's a couple instances of nefertiti standing on a prow of a boat in full smiting motif with crown like everything like very you know never fully masculinized as like hatsepsha did earlier um but you never see Hatsapsha in the smiting motif, which is very interesting, um, very masculine, masculine position. Nefertiti's blue crown too is a little bit more, you know, she starts that and that's a little bit more masculine as well. So they're definitely playing with gender norms and these things during during his, um, the Am Amarna interlude, for sure. That's really cool. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. It looks like we had no questions to roll in. Um, you blew everybody away. <laughs> Very glad. It's the end of the okay. quarter and or semester for you guys, right? So <laughs> yes, I'm sure. Yeah, I'm a semester. Tired. Um, <laughs> but you are the last uh, brown bag lecture. Thank you, everybody, for coming out. Thank you, Jordan, for such a great lecture. Um, and we will resume brown bag lectures next semester. So we hope to see you all there. Thank you again, and everybody have a great rest of your day and a wonderful weekend. Bye, everybody. Thank you, guys. Thank you for Bye, having Jordan. me. Bye. Thank you.